It was in 1794 that Captain Barton, the younger brother of Sir James Barton, baronet, returned to Dublin. He'd served with some distinction in the Navy, having commanded one of His Majesty's frigates in the American War. Now, he was 43 then when I first met him, and I found him to be an intelligent and an agreeable fellow. Now, he had not contracted any of the brusqueness that one sometimes acquires at sea. His manners were easy, quiet and polished, and he deported himself in society as a man of the world, a gentleman. In his personal habits, he was frugal. He occupied lodgings in the south side of town. He kept but one horse and one servant. And although a reputed free thinker, he nevertheless led an orderly and a moral life. You know, he didn't drink to excess or gamble. Being of good family and in affluent circumstances, he had, of course, ready access to the best houses in Dublin. But you see, when he did mix in gay society, you sense that it was rather for the sake of its bustle and distraction rather than for any opportunities it offered of interchanging thought or feeling with its votaries. I mean, he lived very much to himself without forming intimacies or choosing any close companions. I mean, I, I was not alone, I'm sure, in judging him to be a prudent, reserved sort of a fellow, perhaps rather moody on occasion, but, but the type that you'd say would likely live to a good old age, die rich and celibate, and leave his money to a hospital. However, not very long after his return to Dublin, a certain young lady, the Miss Clarissa Montague, was introduced into the gay world by her aunt, the Dowager Lady Lampton. Now, she was, she was a a decidedly pretty and accomplished young thing, this Miss Montague, and having some natural cleverness and a great deal of gaiety, she became for a while a reigning toast. Her popularity, however, gained her for a time nothing more than that insubstantial admiration which, however pleasant as an incense to vanity, is by no means necessarily antecedent to matrimony, because, unhappily for Clarissa Montague, it was understood that Beyond her personal attractions, she had no kind of earthly provision. She was quite, quite penniless. Such being the state of affairs, it was a, a matter of the greatest surprise when Captain Barton emerged as the avowed lover of Miss Montague. And his suit prospered, as one might expect, and in a, a short time it was communicated by Lady Lampton to each of her 150 closest friends that the captain had tendered proposals of marriage to her niece, who had moreover accepted the offer conditionally upon the consent of a father who was then on his way back from India and expected home in two or three weeks. Now, about this consent, there could be no doubt at all. The delay was merely one of form. The couple were therefore looked upon as absolutely engaged. And Lady Lampton, with a, a rigour of old-fashioned decorum with which her niece would no doubt gladly have dispensed, immediately withdrew her from all further participation in the gaieties of the town. I mean, Captain Barton himself, of course, was a, a constant visitor to the house and was permitted all the privileges of intimacy which a betrothed suitor is usually accorded. And such was the relation of the parties when the mysterious circumstances which darkened my narrative first began to unfold themselves. Lady Lampton resided in a handsome mansion in the north side of Dublin, while Captain Barton's lodgings were, as I've said, situated to the south. Now, the distance between these two properties was considerable, but it was Captain Barton's habit, after he'd passed the evening with the two ladies, to make his way home on foot. One night, shortly after his engagement, he happened to remain unusually late at Lady Lampton's house. The, the conversation had turned upon religion, and the captain had held forth with the callous scepticism of the confirmed infidel. Now, what were called French principles had in those days found their way into fashionable society, and neither the old lady nor her charge were so perfectly free from the taint as to look upon his views as any serious objection to the proposed union. The discussion had gradually degenerated into one upon the supernatural in general, and Barton had pursued the same line of ridicule with the same sceptical vigour. Now, in all of this, I, I must clearly state 
Captain Barton was guilty of no affectation. I mean, the, the, the doctrines upon which he insisted were too truly the basis of his own fixed belief. And perhaps not the least strange or of the many strange circumstances connected with this story is the fact that the subject of the fearful influences which I'm about to describe was himself from the deliberate conviction of years an utter disbeliever in what are usually termed preternatural agencies. Well, on this particular evening, it was well after midnight by the time Barton took his leave of the two ladies. The moon was shining mistily as he set out on his solitary walk home, and that utter silence, which has in it something indefinably exciting, reigned making the sound of his footsteps seem unnaturally loud and distinct. His shortest way home lay through a line of street which had as yet been merely laid out, a little more than the, the foundations of the houses had been constructed. And Barton had just reached this lonely, unfinished road. And on a sudden, he heard other footsteps pattering at a measured pace about two score yards behind him. Well, I mean, the, the, the suspicion of being followed is unpleasant at any time, more especially in so lonely a spot. And this suspicion became so strong in Barton's mind that he turned about to confront his pursuer. There was nobody there. Hmm. Well, I mean, the steps must have been a, a reverberation of his own, he thought. But no. He stamped his foot upon the ground several times, and he walked briskly up and down, and he quite failed to awaken anything like an echo. Now, though by no means a fanciful person, he, he was at last sliced fain to charge the sounds upon his imagination. He, he, he shook his head and, and resumed his walk, and before he proceeded a dozen paces, the mysterious footfall was heard again behind him, and this time, as if with the intention of showing that the sounds were not an echo, the steps slackened, sometimes nearly to a halt, and sometimes they hurried on for six or eight strides at a run. Well, as before, Captain Barton turned round, and as before, nothing was visible above the deserted level of the road. And he walked back over the same ground, determined to find the source of these sounds, which had so strangely disconcerted him. But there was absolutely nothing there. Now, in spite of his scepticism, Barton felt something like a, a superstitious fear stealing upon him. And, and with these unwanted sensations, he once more turned and pursued his way. There was no repetition of the sounds until he reached the point where he'd stopped to retrace his steps. And here they were instantly renewed. Again, with sudden starts of running, which threatened to bring the unseen pursuer right up to his back, Captain Barton stopped again, turned again, and yielding to the excitement that was gaining upon him, he shouted out, Who goes there? Well, I mean, the sound of one's own voice raised in utter solitude and followed by total silence is dismaying at any time. And Barton now felt a degree of discomfort that he'd never known before. To the very end of this solitary street, these steps pursued him, and it required the strongest effort on his part to resist the impulse to run the rest of the way home. Indeed, it was not until he had reached his lodgings and was sat by his fireside that he, he felt sufficiently comfortable to rearrange and reconsider the occurrences which had so discomposed him. Next morning, he was sitting at breakfast, reflecting upon the incidents of the previous night with perhaps more inquisitiveness than awe, when a letter was placed before him. It was written in an unfamiliar hand, and it addressed him obliquely. Mr. Barton, late captain of the Dolphin, is warned of danger. He will do wisely to avoid Fitzwilliam Street. If he walks there as usual, he will meet with something unlucky. Let him take warning, for he has reason to dread... 
the Watcher. Oh, Captain Parton read and reread this strange effusion. He turned it over under every light and in every direction. He examined the, the paper on which it was written. He scrutinised the handwriting, looked, looked closely at the seal, but there was not the slightest clue as to its possible origin. <laughs> this was rather a vexing puzzle, he reflected, and one moreover, unpleasantly suggestive in his mind of other associations connected with last night's adventure. Now, in obedience to some feeling, I, I rather suspect that it was pride, Mr Barton did not tell anyone, even his intended bride, about these strange occurrences. I mean, trifling as they, they might appear, they had most disagreeably affected his imagination, and he, he did not care to disclose what might be looked upon as evidences of weakness. I mean, that the letter might be a hoax and the mysterious footfall a delusion, but although he affected to treat the whole affair as unworthy of a second thought, it haunted him, and for a considerable time afterwards, he took pains to avoid Fitzwilliam Street. Well, it was not until about a week after the receipt of the letter that anything occurred to remind Captain Barton of its contents. And then, one night, he was returning from the theatre in Crow Street, having seen Miss Montague and Lady Lampton into their carriage. He loitered for some time with two or three acquaintances. He parted with these close to Trinity College and pursued his way home alone. It was now fully one o'clock and the, the streets were deserted. Now, during the brief walk with his companions, he'd been aware several times of the sound of footsteps behind him, and once or twice he had looked back to find the street deserted. Proceeding now alone, he grew extremely uncomfortable as he became sensible of the by now familiar sounds. They had the same unequal pace, sometimes slow, sometimes quickened, almost to a run. You know, again and again he turned round almost at every half dozen steps, and no one was ever visible. The irritation of this unseen pursuit became gradually all but intolerable. And when at last he reached his house, his nerves were strung to such a pitch of excitement that he didn't even attempt to lie down until daylight had broken. He was awakened by a knock at his chamber door, and his servant handed him a letter. He recognised the handwriting at once. You may as well think, Captain Barton, it said to escape from your own shadow as from me. Do what you may. I will see you as often as I please, and you shall see me, for I do not want to hide myself as you fancy. Do not let it trouble your rest, for with a good conscience, what need you fear from the eye of the watcher? It's scarcely necessary, I think, to dwell upon the feelings that accompanied the perusal of this strange communication. I mean, whatever he might think of the, the phantom steps which dogged him, there could be no doubt about the reality of the letters and their immediate sequence upon the, the mysterious sounds was an odd coincidence, to say the least. The whole circumstance was in his mind vaguely and instinctively connected with certain passages in his past life, which above all others he, he hated to remember. Now, fortunately for him, perhaps, Captain Barton had at this time some business of an engrossing kind connected with a, a long-standing lawsuit, and the hurry and excitement of this did much to distract him. In a little while, in fact, his, his spirits had very nearly recovered their accustomed tone. But you see, even so, did, during all this time, he was, every now and again, in lonely places, by day as well as by night, dismayed by the, the half-heard repetition of those footsteps. And before long, a very different phase of his haunting began. Mm. Now, I happened to be walking with him one afternoon over by College Green. This was, in fact, one of the few occasions on which I was alone with him. We were conversing, agreeably enough, when a man, he was very short in stature, I remember, and wearing a kind of 
a fur travelling cap, walked very rapidly towards us as if under some fierce excitement, muttering vehemently to himself as he went. Now, the, the, this odd-looking fellow, he looked like a foreigner to me, walked straight up to Barton and regarded him for a moment with a look of maniacal menace and fury. Then he spluttered some words, turned abruptly about, walked away from us at the same agitated pace and disappeared up a side passage. Well, I mean, I, I was rather taken aback myself. The, 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 the countenance and bearing of this strange little man had, had impressed me with a very real sense of danger. But I was absolutely astonished at his effect upon Captain Barton. He recoiled a step or two as the stranger advanced and grabbed my arm with what I can only call a spasm of terror. And then, as the man disappeared, he shoved me back, followed after him a few faces, stopped, and leaned heavily against the wall. I mean, I never in my life before beheld a face more ghastly and haggard. Heavens, Barton, what, what's the matter with you? Are you, are you ill? What did he say? That man, what, what was it he said? What? <laughs> Who cares what the fellow said? Hey, now, hey, Barton, look, let me get you a coach. You, you're clearly unwell. No, I'm not unwell. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm not unwell. I, 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 I am perhaps a little fatigued, a, a little overworked, but I'm, I'm better now. Sorry. Come on. I... I Please, let's continue. What? No, no, no. I'm sorry, Barton, really. I, look, just take my advice and go home. You're not well. You look terrible. I'm, I, I'm sorry, but I, I really must insist. Well, he, he was not disinclined to be persuaded, and he, he left me, declining my offered escort. And I watched him into a carriage, little satisfied, I must say, with his plea of fatigue and overwork. I called the... The next day at his lodgings, and I learned from his servant that he had not left his room since his return the night before, but that he was not seriously indisposed, and he hoped to be out again in a few days. Well, that evening, he sent for Dr. Rennick, who was then in large and fashionable practice in Dublin, and the interview was a decidedly odd one. Captain Barton described his symptoms in a desultory way, complaining of occasional palpitations and headaches. Now, suspecting that there was more to it from the start, Dr. Rennick asked him whether there was any particular anxiety then occupying his thoughts, and this he denied almost peevishly, upon which the physician declared his opinion that there was nothing more amiss than some slight derangement of the digestion, for which he accordingly wrote a prescription. Now, he was about to withdraw, when Captain Barton called him back. I beg your pardon, doctor. I'm sorry, I, I almost forgot. I wondered if I might ask you two or three medical questions. I, they, they, they'll seem rather odd ones, perhaps. Well, well you see, a, a wager depends upon their solution. Well, Dr. Rennick said that he, he would do his best to answer any questions that he had. Good, thank you, doctor. Um, <laughs> You will think them very childish questions, I fear, but I, 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 I can't recover my wager without a decision. So, well, first of all, I want to know about lockjaw. Huh? If a, a man has died of lockjaw, and, 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 uh, so much so that a physician of average skill pronounces him to be actually dead, well, might he after all recover? The physician smiled and shook his head. No, Mr. Barton. But, 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 but a blunder may be made, I mean. You know? I mean suppose an, an, an ignorant pretender to medical skill. No, 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 Mr. Barton. No one who has ever seen death could possibly mistake it in a case of lockjaw. I see. I, yeah, thank you. Well, <laughs> this may seem even more childish than I fear, but, but, but please, can, can you tell me are the regulations of foreign hospitals, such as that of, say, Naples, very lax and bungling? I mean, might all sorts of blunders and slips occur in, in hospital like Naples? Dr. Renner 
protests his incompetence to, to answer that question. Well then, Doctor, here, here is my last question, and, and please, please don't laugh at it, but is there any disease in, in all the range of human maladies which could have the effect of perceptibly contracting the stature of a man? You know, causing a man to shrink in all his proportions and yet to preserve his exact resemblance to himself in every particular. I mean, any disease, Doctor, no matter how rare, which could possibly result in that effect. Well, the physician replied with a smile and a very decided negative. Tell me then, Doctor, if a man is in reasonable fear of assault from a lunatic, can he procure a warrant for his arrest? Well, uh, that really is more a lawyer's question than a doctor's, Mr. Barton. But yes, I, I believe that, yes, on applying to a magistrate, such a course can be directed. Well, the, the physician then took his leave. But just as he reached the hall door, he remembered that he left his cane upstairs and he returned. His reappearance was rather awkward because a piece of paper, which he recognised as his own prescription, was slowly burning in the fireplace, while Barton sat close by with an expression of intense gloom and dismay. Now, Dr. Rennick, of course, had had too much tact to say anything, but he had seen enough to convince him that it was the mind and not the body of Captain Barton, which was in reality the seat of the suffering. A few days later, the following advertisement appeared in a Dublin newspaper. If Sylvester Yelland, formerly a foremast man on board His Majesty's frigate Dolphin, will apply to Mr. Hubert Smith, attorney, at his office on Dame Street, he may hear of something greatly to his advantage. Admission may be had at any hour up to 12 o'clock at night, and the strictest secrecy as to all communications shall be honourably observed. Now, the Dolphin, as I, I, I've already mentioned, I think, was the vessel which Captain Barton had commanded during the war. And this suggested to Dr. Rennick that Captain Barton's unease was somehow connected with the individual, what Sylvester Yelland, to whom the advertisement was addressed, and that he himself was the author of it. This, however, of course, I, I must add, was merely a conjecture. Captain Barton, in the meantime, sought to maintain, in public at least, a cheerful demeanour. And not long after his meeting with the doctor, he attended a grand dinner of the Freemasons, of which worthy fraternity he was a brother. Now, he, he had at first seemed gloomy and abstracted, but it was noticed that he drank more freely than was his wont that night, and gradually, under the influence of good wine and pleasant company, he became unusually talkative and even noisy. It was about half past ten when he, he left the dinner, and as conviviality is a strong incentive to gallantry, it occurred to him to proceed forthwith to Lady Lampton's and to pass the remainder of the evening with her and his intended bride. Accordingly, he was soon at their house chatting gaily with the ladies. Now, sorry, it's not to be supposed that Captain Barton had exceeded the limits which propriety prescribes too good fellowship. You know, he, he'd merely taken enough wine to raise his spirits without in the least degree unsteadying his mind or affecting his manners. But you see, as, as the, the night wore on, the, the, this artificial gaiety did begin to flag as recent anxieties intruded themselves once more. And by the time he took his leave of the ladies, his mind was haunted by a thousand mysterious apprehensions. Now, he might easily, of course, have called a coach or returned home by a different route. But you see, with a, a half-desperate resolution to force matters to a crisis, he determined instead to follow precisely the course which he'd been warned against by his mysterious correspondent. Well, the, the pilot who steers his vessel under the muzzles of a hostile battery never felt his resolution more severely tasked than did Captain Barton then, as he pursued his solitary path, a path which, in spite of every effort of scepticism, he felt to be infested by some malignant being. He walked rapidly, scarcely breathing from suspense, 
but he was troubled by no renewal of the dreaded footsteps. Now he was beginning to feel something like a return of confidence as he approached the long line of lamps which indicated the more well-frequented streets when he heard the report of a musket behind him and the whistle of a bullet close by his head. Now, his first impulse was to run in pursuit of his would-be assassin. But no sound was audible to direct his pursuit. He could not hear a footstep. With the tumultuous sensations of one whose life has just been exposed to a murderous attempt, Captain Barton turned again, and without actually quickening his pace to a run, he hurried on his way. Now, he just set off, and who should he see coming towards him but a tiny man in a fur cap. He was walking at the same exaggerated pace as before, and with the same strange air of menace. And as he passed Barton, he spluttered in a furious whisper, Still alive! Still alive! Too bad! Too bad! Well, the depressed states of Captain Barton's spirit now began to work a corresponding attention in his looks. I mean, it was impossible, of course, that this change should escape general remark. And yet, you see, he took no steps to report this obvious attempt upon his life. In fact, he kept it jealously to himself. And the mind, thus turned one upon itself, became more excited. It was not long after this narrow escape with his life that Barton called upon the celebrated preacher, Dr. Matlin, and an extraordinary conversation ensued. The, the divine was, was seated in his chambers deep in theology when his visitor was announced, and after the usual interchange of polite greeting, Barton began. This is a strange call, Dr. Macklin, and, and, and I, I should not, under ordinary circumstances, have ventured to disturb you, but my visit is no idle intrusion, and, and I'm sure that you will not count it so when I tell you how afflicted I am. Oh, well, I, I shall be honoured to help in any way I can, Captain Barton. Please, sit down. Thank you. Um, Doctor, I, I, I'm come to test your patience by asking for your advice. I mean, and when I say your patience, I might have said your humanity, your compassion, because I suffer greatly. Oh, my dear sir, it will afford me infinite gratification if I can give you any comfort. But, well, I know, I, I, I know what you would say, that, that I'm an unbeliever, incapable of deriving help from religion, yes. But please do not assume that, however unsettled my convictions may be, I do not feel a deep, a very deep interest in the subject. You know, circumstances have lately forced me to review the whole question of revelation in a more candid spirit than I ever did before. He paused again and the doctor pressed him to proceed. Well, the fact is, whatever may have been my uncertainty about such matters before, I am now convinced horribly convinced that there is a spiritual world beyond the world that we see, a, 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 a system whose workings are generally mercifully hidden from us, but which sometimes is partially revealed. I, I know that there is a God, a dreadful God, and that retribution follows guilt in ways most mysterious and terrific. There, there is a spiritual system, good God, Oh, I've been convinced, a system malignant and implacable and omnipotent under whose persecutions I am now suffering the torments of the damned. Yes, sir, the very fires and frenzy of hell itself. My dear sir, I, 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 I fear that you, you have been very unhappy. But I, I venture to predict that the 
depression un under which you labour will be found to originate in purely physical causes. And, and that with a change of air, you know, the, the aid of a few tonics, your, your spirits will return. Be be believe me, a, a little attention to diet, exercise. Oh, no, 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 doctor, no, sorry. I, I, I cannot delude myself about that. I, I have no hope to cling to but one that by some other spiritual agency more potent than that which tortures me, I may be delivered. If not, then I'm lost. Now, Mr. Barton, you must remember that, that, that others have suffered as you have done. No, 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 sir, no, no. I'm not a, I'm not a superstitious man. You know, I have perhaps been too much the reverse, but I'm now at last constrained to believe. You know, I have no escape from the... The, the, the dire conviction, the overwhelming certainty that I'm haunted and dogged, go where I may, by a demon. Well, God help you, my dear friend. God help you. But will he, doctor? Will he help me? If you pray to him in a humble and trusting spirit, oh, pray to doctor. I can't pray. I could as easily move a mountain. I've not the belief to pray that there is something within me that cannot pray. You, you prescribe impossibilities, literal impossibilities. You will not find it so if you but try. Oh, God, I have tried. I have tried and tried and tried, and the attempt only fills me with greater terror. You know, the, the unbearable concept of eternity maddens my brain whenever it, it approaches contemplation of a creator. No, Dr. Macklin, not prayer. Prayer will not work for me. If I'm to be saved, it must be by some other means. Well, then, sir, how is it that you would have me help you? Listen, Dr. Macklin, please. Just listen. And then Barton proceeded to relate the, the circumstances with which I've already detailed to you. This has now become habitual, you understand. I, mean, I, I don't mean actually seeing him in the flesh. That, that thank God, uh, is not permitted daily. But, but from the consciousness that a malignant spirit is following me and watching me wherever I go, I never have for a single instant a temporary respite. You know, I, I'm pursued by blasphemies. Cries of despair and appalling hatred. I, I hear them as I turn the corners of the streets. You know, they come at night when I when I sit in my chamber, charging me with the most ghastly crimes, you know, threatening me with vengeance. And now there, there, you you, you hear that? Will, will that convince you? I hear the wind, Dr. Barton, the, the prince of the powers of the air. Oh, tut tut, sir. You must resist these impulses of the imagination. Oh, I resist the devil and he will flee from me. My dear sir, this is but fancy. You are your own tormentor. No, fancy has no part in it. But if you have seen this person so frequently, then why do you not accost him? Hmm? Captain Barton. Now, is it not a little precipitate? to assume the existence of preternatural agency when everything may easily be accountable if only proper means were taken to sift the matter. There are circumstances, Dr. Macklin, connected with the appearance, which it is needless for me to disclose, but which are proofs of its horrible nature. I know that the being that follows me is not human. And as you're costing it, oh, God. He leaned his elbow on the table and passed his hand over his eyes. Dr. Macklin, he said abruptly, you now know the circumstances and the, the nature of my affliction. I, 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 I tell you that I cannot help myself. I am utterly passive. I adjure you to weigh my case. You know, if anything may be done for me by vicarious supplication, by intercession, by any influence, whatever, I implore you in the name of the Most High God, give me the benefit of that influence. You know, send me away with some faint hope and I will nerve myself to endure. Well, Dr. Macklin assured him that he could do all that he would 
and he would pray earnestly for him. And so they parted with a hurried and rather melancholy valediction. It was not to be expected, of course, that Captain Barton's changed habit should long escape remark and discussion. And from the very commencement of this change, Miss Montague had, of course, been aware of it. His visits to her became at length so interrupted, his manner so strange and agitated, that Lady Lampton one day distinctly stated her anxiety and pressed for an explanation. Well, it was freely given. And although its nature at first relieved the worst solicitudes of the old lady and her niece, it was enough, upon a little reflection, to fill their minds with alarm. It was around this time also that the young lady's father arrived back in Dublin. Now, General Montague had known Barton slightly some 10 or 12 years previously, and he regarded him as a most desirable match for his daughter. He laughed at this story of supernatural visitations, and he, he lost no time in calling upon his intended son-in-law to share his thoughts. Now, lad, he said after the preliminaries, my sister tells me that you've got a dose of the blue devils in a rather new and original shape. Oh. Barton sighed. Come on now, lad. That won't do. You look more like a man on his way to the gallows than the altar. Please, General, I know. No, 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 no. I'm going to have my say, all right, on this magnificent mock mystery of yours. It's too bad to see a, a full-grown Navy man frightened by a bugaboo. You don't know. Oh, I... I know enough, believe me. Yeah, now I've heard all about this little man in a funny hat and a great coat, eh? eh? Red vest, ugly face, pops round street corners, throws you into fits. Ooh. Well, yeah, I tell you, I've made it my business to catch this little mountebank and either beat him to a jelly with my own hands or have him whipped through the town before the month passes. Now, he was running on in the same strain when Barton, who had approached the window, suddenly staggered back with a cry and pointed towards the street. Ah! He's there! By heaven, he's there! Now! What? General Montague leapt to his feet and from the window of the drawing room, yeah, he clearly saw a figure who corresponded exactly with the description of the man that he'd just been talking about. Well, he was just turning from the, the rails in front of the house, and without waiting to see more, the old soldier snatched his cane and rushed down the street and into the, rushed down the stairs and into the street. He looked around him, then he ran breathlessly to the nearest corner. Back and forth he ran from crossing to crossing, and it was not until the laughter of passers-by drew attention to the absurdity of pursuit that he checked his pace, lowered his cane, and came back to the house. He found Barton trembling in every joint. You saw him? Yeah. Well, I, well I, I saw somebody. But the fellow runs like a lamplighter. He'd gone before I reached the hall door. Yeah, well, next time. And he gad, when I do get within reach of him, he will damn well feel the weight of the Montague cane upon his shoulders. Notwithstanding the general's bluster, however, nowhere and at no time was Barton secure against the odious appearance which haunted him with such diabolic perseverance. His depression, his misery and his excitement now became more settled and alarming every day. And the the mental agonies that preyed upon him began at last to so sensibly affect his health that General Montague persuaded him without too much difficulty to try a short tour of the continent in the hope that a, a change of scene might benefit. I mean, it was plain, reasoned the general, that if Barton could simply be convinced that there was nothing preternatural in the phenomenon that he'd experienced, then the affair would quickly lose all terror in his eyes. And, and if the annoyance could be escaped by mere locomotion and change of scene, it obviously could not have originated in any supernatural agency. And so, within no short space of time, he and Barton left Dublin for England. They posted rapidly to London and thence to Dover, whence they took the packet with a fair wind for Calais. 
and the general's confidence in the success of his plan rose daily, for to Barton's inexpressible relief, he had not, since leaving Ireland, so much as fancied a repetition of those impressions which had, when at home, drawn him gradually to the very depth of despair. The, 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 this exemption from what, what he'd begun to regard as the inevitable condition of his existence and the, the sense of security which began to pervade his mind was really inexpressibly delightful to him. And in, in the exultation of what he considered his deliverance, he indulged in a thousand happy anticipations for a future into which so lately he'd hardly dared look. It, it was a very beautiful day when they, they arrived in Calais. A, a, colourful crowd of idlers stood on the jetty to receive the packet and enjoy the bustle of the new arrivals. Now General Montague was walking a few paces ahead of his friend and as he made his way through the crowd a man touched his arm and said in a, a broad provincial patois, Monsieur we look to his friend, he seems to be fainting, he, he is sick perhaps. Montague turned quickly and he saw that Barton did indeed look very Pale and confused, he, he hastened to his side. My dear fellow, he, are you all right? The question went unheeded, and twice repeated, ere Barton stammered, I saw him. Oh, God, I saw him. You, what, him? Where? Where, where is he, damn it? cried Montague, looking round. He's gone now, but where, where, where was he? Oh, for God's sake, man, tell me, where was he? Here. Here. Just now, he, he touched your arm. He, he pointed at me. God grant me mercy. Now, Montague had already bustled away in a flurry of mingled hope and rage. But although the stranger who'd accosted him was still vividly impressed upon his memory, he failed to discover among the crowd even the slightest resemblance to him. And at length, out of breath and sweating, he returned to the stunned Barton. Now, don't you worry, son. We will jockey this scoundrel yet. Yeah, never you mind. We will, we will get him this time. But it was wasted labour to try to comfort Barton now. He became desponding. His first object, he insisted, was now to return to Ireland, where he expected, he almost hoped, that he would speedily die. On disembarking in Dublin, one of the first faces that he saw was that of his implacable and dreaded attendant. Well, by now he, he had, had lost not only all enjoyment in life, but all independence of will besides. He submitted passively to the management of his friends, and as a last resort, it was determined to remove him to a house of Lady Lampton's in the neighbourhood of Clontarf. He was to confine himself strictly to the house and make use only of those apartments which commanded a view of an enclosed yard, the gates of which were to be always kept locked. Cheerful society was to be supplied, and it was hoped that under this treatment, the captain's obstinate hypochondria might at length give way. And indeed, over time, a definite improvement in the patient's health and spirits was noted. I mean, not anything like a recovery was discernible, but certainly an improvement. And as such, this was welcomed with gratitude. A week passed, a fortnight, a month without any recurrence of the hated visitation. And gradually, something of human interest began to reanimate Captain Barton. One day, however, Lady Lampton, who, who, like most old ladies of her day, was a great pretender to medical science, dispatched her maid to the kitchen garden with a list of herbs. The girl returned, however, very shortly, a good deal flustered and upset. It appeared that, that she had just begun to gather the herbs from that corner of the garden in which they flourished, when she was interrupted in her work by an ill-natured laugh, and looking up, she saw through the old thorn hedge which surrounded the garden a singularly ugly little man standing menacingly close to her 
at the other side of the hawthorn screen. And she was for a moment utterly unable to move or speak while he charged her with a message for Captain Barton, the substance of which was that he must come abroad as usual and show himself out of doors or else prepare for a visit in his own chamber. On conclusion of this message, the stranger had clambered down into the outer ditch and seizing the hawthorn stems in his hands, seemed on the point of climbing through the fence to get at her. And without awaiting this result, the girl had turned and fled back to the house. Now, Lady Lampton commanded her on pain of instant dismissal to observe an absolute silence about what had happened. And she directed that an instant search be made of the garden and the adjacent fields. This was, as expected, unsuccessful and filled with misgivings. Lady Lampton consulted with her brother. Both agreed that the, that the incident should be kept secret from Barton himself, whose gradual recovery seemed to continue. In fact, at length, he, he felt well enough occasionally to, to walk in the enclosed garden outside his room. He felt safe there and... and but for a careless violation of orders by one of the grooms, he, he might have enjoyed his immunity for some time longer. Now, you see, this yard was, as I say, quite enclosed by a high fence, but it was accessible from the public road by a wooden door, to reach which one had to first pass through an iron gate. Now, strict orders, of course, had been given to keep both of these entrances locked. But in spite of these, it happened one day that as Barton was pacing the enclosure, he saw the wooden door ajar and the face of his tormentor peering at him through the iron bars. For a few seconds, he stood riveted to the earth. Then he fell insensible to the pavement. General Montague found him there a few moments later and he was conveyed to his room. And henceforth, a final change in Barton's behaviour became observable. He, he, he was no longer excited. He was no longer the, the despairing man that he'd been for so long. Now, an, an unearthly tranquility reigned. It was, I think, the anticipated stillness of the grave. The struggle is nearly over, he said to the general when he came to. My punishment is nearly ended. From sorrow, perhaps, I shall never escape. But my agony is almost over. Comfort has been revealed to me. And what remains, I will bear with submission. That's the spirit, lad, said Montague. Yes, peace and good cheer are all you need to make you what you were. Oh, no, 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 no. I, 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 can, I can never be that again. I am to see him but once more, and then all is ended. Well, he, he said so, did he? He, oh, no, no, no. No, good tidings could never come through him. And these came so sweetly. With such unutterable love and melancholy. And as Barton said this, he shed tears. Oh, come on now, said Montague. Please, you know, no weeping, old boy. Yeah? I mean, what is it after all but a... A pack of dreams and nonsense, eh? Or at worst, the, the mischief or some scheming rascal, a, a sneaking vagabond who owes you a grudge. <laughs> a grudge? <laughs> yes, indeed, he, he owes me a grudge. Oh, God. When the justice of heaven permits the evil one to carry out a scheme of vengeance. But heaven has been merciful to me. Hope has opened to me at last. My death is welcome, and yet I shrink with an agony, an actual frenzy of terror from the last encounter. I am to see him again once more, but under circumstances so unutterably more dreadful than ever before. He trembled so violently now that Montague grew really alarmed and hastened to lead him back to the topic which had seemed to exert so tranquilizing an effect upon his mind. It was not a dream, he said after a time. I was in a different state, and yet it was all as real 
as clear and vivid as what I see and hear now. And what did you see and hear? When I wakened from the swoon, I fell into upon seeing him. I was lying by the margin of a broad lake with misty hills all round, illuminated by a soft, melancholy, rose-coloured light. It was unusually sad and lonely and yet more beautiful than any earthly scene. My head was leaning in the lap of a girl and she was singing a song that told, I know not how, whether by words or harmonies, of all my life, of all that is past, of all that is still to come. And with that song, the, the, the old feelings that I thought had perished within me, they came back and the tears flowed from my eyes, partly for the song and for its mysterious beauty, and partly for the unearthly sweetness of a voice. I knew the voice, you see. And then slowly, slowly, the, the song and the scene grew fainter, till it was all dark and skill and cold again. And I awoke comforted, because I knew that I was forgiven much. And Barton wept again, long and bitterly. Now, from this time, as I said, the, the prevailing tone of his mind was one of profound and tranquil melancholy. But you see, even this was not without its interruptions. He was thoroughly impressed by the conviction that he was to experience another final visitation. What one that would transcend in horror everything that he experienced heretofore. And from this anticipated agony, he often shrank in such paroxysms of terror as filled the whole household with superstitious panic. I mean, even those who affected to discredit the theory of preternatural agency were often in their secret souls visited during the, the silence of the night with qualms and apprehensions. And no one attempted to dissuade Barton from the resolution upon which he now acted of shutting himself up in his apartment. You know, the, the, the window blinds of his room were to be kept permanently down. His own valet was to be seldom out of his presence, day or night. Total solitude, even for a moment, had become intolerable to him. Now, it's needless to say, I'm sure, that under these circumstances, no, no steps were taken towards the fulfilment of that engagement into which Captain Barton had entered. And, and in fact, there, there was quite disparity enough in point of years and indeed habits between him and Miss Montague to have precluded any very vehement attachment on her part. So although grieved and anxious, she was, she was very far from being heartbroken. Now, young ladies, as, as you probably know yourselves, are much given to the cultivation of pets. And among those who shared the favour of Miss Montague was a very large owl. The, the, the gardener had caught him napping one day among the ivy of a ruined stable and had presented it to her. And in no short space of time, that this grim, ill-favoured bird had become a favourite companion. And trifling as this may seem, I, I, I am forced to mention it because it is connected closely with the concluding scene of this story. Barton himself, so far from sharing Miss Montague's liking for the bird, regarded it from the first with a, a violent antipathy. I mean, its very vicinity was insupportable to him. It was almost funny how, how much he hated the thing. At almost two o'clock one winter's night, Barton was in bed. His servant occupied the same room. A light was burning, and Barton suddenly sat up and spoke out loud. It's here, isn't it, Smith, that accursed owl lurking in some corner. God, I can't stop dreaming about him. Get up and look for him, will you? I can't get it out of my head that it, it snuck in somehow. Well, the, the servant rose and set about examining the chamber. 
And as he did so, he heard that well-known sound, more like a, a long-drawn gasp than a hiss with which those birds affright the, the quiet of the night. Now, the sound seemed to come from the passage outside, so Smith stepped out into this to drive the bird away. No sooner had he left the room than the door swung shut behind him. Now, immediately over the bedroom door, there was a kind of a window, and through this, the rays of Barton's candle could now be seen. As Smith continued his search for the owl, he heard his master, who in his curtained bed had not, it seemed, perceived his own exit from the room, call out and ask him to place the candle on the table by his bed. Not liking to raise his voice, the, the servant began to walk back to the chamber door, when to his amazement, he heard another voice within the room answering his master. And he saw through the window above the door that the light was shifting as if being carried across the room. Well, palsied by fear and curiosity, he stood breathless, listening at the threshold. There was a rustling of curtains followed by the sound of a low, almost cooing voice, like one that hushes a child to rest. Then he heard Barton say, in a tone of stifled horror, Oh God! My God! And repeat the same exclamation several times. There followed another silence, which was broken again by the same strange soothing, hushing sound, and then at last burst forth in one swelling peal, a shriek of agony so hideous that the servant instinctively rushed to the door and threw his whole weight against it. It held firm, however, and as he tugged and pushed and twisted the handle, yell after yell rang louder and wilder through the chamber, accompanied all the time by those same hushing sounds. Scarce knowing what he did, Smith turned and ran down the passageway towards the stairhead where he almost collided with General Montague. And just as the two men met, the fearful sound ceased. What is it, man? Where's your master? Lord, I'm not honest, sir. He's, he's gone quiet. He's dead, sir. I'm sure he's dead. What? Move aside, man. You don't know what you're talking about. Montague, closely followed by the servant, hurried to the chamber door, turned the handle and pushed. And as the door yielded to his pressure, the ill-omened bird of which the servant had been in search uttered its spectral warning, started suddenly from the far side of the bed and flying through the doorway above their heads, crashed through a skylight and sailed away into the darkness of the night. Damn that bird, said the general, startled by the suddenness of this apparition. The candles moved, sir. Look, said Smith. Look, they put it by the bed. Well, draw the curtains then and, and don't stand gaping there. Smith hesitated. Oh, damn it, man. Move aside. I'll open them myself. And General Montague angrily drew the curtains apart around the bed. The light of the candle, which was burning at the bedside, fell upon a figure huddled and half upright at the head of the bed. It seemed as though he'd slunk back as far as the solid panelled wall would allow, and his hands were still clutching the bedclothes. Barton, said the general. Barton! He took the candle and held it so that it shone full upon the face. The features were fixed, stern and white. The jaw was fallen and the dead, sightless eyes, still open, gazed vacantly towards the foot of the bed. Good God, muttered the general. And look, sir, look. Smith was pointing to a deep indenture, as if caused by heavy pressure on the mattress near the foot of the bed. There was someone with him, sir. There was someone sitting there. 
Montague was silent. And he remained so while Smith loosened the rigid grip with which the dead man's fingers clutched the bedclothes and drew the awful figure into a reclining position. Then, closing the curtains of the bed carefully, he helped the general out of the room. Well, it is needless, I think, to follow all the, the characters connected with this narrative into the events of their afterlife. Let it be enough to say that no clue to the solution of these mysterious circumstances has ever been discovered. And so long an interval has now since passed, since the events that I've described, that I think it is scarcely to be expected that time can throw any new light upon their dark and inexplicable outline. Until the secrets of the earth shall be no longer hidden, these transactions must remain shrouded in their original obscurity. The only occurrence in Captain Barton's former life to which reference was ever made as having any possible connection to the sufferings with which his existence closed was not brought to light until several years after his death. Now, the, the, the nature of these disclosures was painful to his relatives, and it is, I'm afraid, discreditable to his memory. It appears that some six years before Captain Barton's final return to Dublin, he had formed in the town of Plymouth a guilty attachment, the object of which was the daughter of one of the ship's crew under his command. Now, the father had visited the frailty of his unhappy child with extreme harshness, and it was said that she had died heartbroken. Presuming upon Barton's implication in her guilt, this man had conducted himself towards him with marked insolence, and Barton retaliated this and his treatment of the unfortunate girl by a systematic exercise of those terrible and arbitrary severities which the, the regulations of the Navy placed at the command of those who are responsible for its discipline. The man had at length made his escape while the vessel was in port at Naples, but he had died, it was said, in a hospital in that town of the wounds inflicted in one of his recent and sanguinary punishments. Now, I, whether these circumstances in reality bear or not upon the, the occurrences of Barton's afterlife, it, it is, of course, impossible to say. I mean, it seems more than probable to me that they were, at least in his own mind, closely associated with them. You see, well... well Whatever the truth may be as to the origin, origin and motives of this mysterious persecution, there can be no doubt that with respect to the agencies by which it was accomplished, absolute and impenetrable mystery is likely to prevail until the day of doom.